lyrical landmines. Y'all want to avoid them because they're going to make your song blow up in a bad way. Welcome to the clan! This is a show dedicated to helping singers, songwriters, and indie artists like you create leverage in the music business because in short that's what you're going to need potential doesn't matter artistic talent doesn't matter what matters is what have you done what can you prove that you are doing that's why we created the show and called it the climb c-l-i-m-b creating leverage in the music business brilliant mm-hmm. oh, that's a baxter name for my good friend and co-host mr brent baxter Brent's an award-winning hit songwriter with cuts by Alan Jackson, Randy Travis, Lady A, Joe Nichols, and two number ones this year. Snapping necks and cashing checks right now. <laughs> <laughs> what I love about Brent is that he helps songwriters like you turn pro by revealing how you write like a pro, do business like a pro, and then he's going to put you in touch with the pros so that you get an opportunity to see where the bar is set and raise your game or create a relationship and go farther on that journey, you can find Brent very easily at songwritingpro.com. Once again, that's songwritingpro.com. And I would like to introduce you to my co-host, Johnny Dwinell. Johnny owns Daredevil Production. They're breaking artists digitally by identifying new fans through data. Listen, if you're an artist looking to increase your streams, blow up your video views, sell more live show tickets, and get discovered by new fans, TV, and music industry pros, then Daredevil Production can help. Daredevil has worked with multi-platinum artists like Colin Ray, Tracy Lawrence, Ty Herndon, and Andy Griggs, just to name a few. You can find Johnny at DaredevilProduction.com. That's production, singular, no S, and there is no S because there is no other. Johnny D. How you doing, brother? Man, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, so happy to have that second number one this year. Feels good. It's a couple weeks back at this... uh, well, I don't know. Hopefully, it's still number one by the time this comes out. By the out. time this airs. I, I vote but, for that. I vote for it's yeah, still number one. For that. Well, I don't know. Yeah, it was say number one for the month by then. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, Hallelujah Homecoming is a single out by Wilburn and Wilburn. I rode with Jason Cox and Kenna West. And so it's uh, just Kenna Jason one. shout out. I know, Jason Cox. So yeah, they were also the writing team on my last or my other number one this year. Can I get a witness? But yeah, Hallelujah Homecoming just hit number one in Southern Gospel. So we're pumped about that. And we're on the climb too. Just trying to climb. Hand over fist. Right. That's right. That's right. So I'm guessing that you didn't get this number one by stepping on lyrical landmines. That is correct. We try to avoid them. It's a different kind of field with different landmines and different spots in Southern Gospel versus country versus CCM versus rock versus right. whatever. They're in different places. Oh, they good are. point. Yeah, you got to know the rules of the road. We've talked about that before in episodes such as you want to be a code breaker and different things like that. But yeah, there's just some lyrical landmines you want to avoid. So at this point, we've already had the event. But at the time of recording, I just finished announcing the lyric pitch event, top 10 and on hold lyrics. So we did this event with Steve Dean. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But basically, I went through and picked these songs from the songwriting pro and climb communities to present to a pro songwriter for a possible co-writer, at least getting on his radar and again, connecting you to the pros. And so there's some fatal flaws, some lyrical landmines. I noticed a lot of these people stepped on. We had over 200 lyrics that were entered. So just some commonality, some common flaws that I saw that I just wanted to point out anonymously, of course, but just to help you avoid your own lyrical landmines. There we go. Well, before we do that, let's take care of a little business here. We're proud as peacocks to be up a peacock, Captain. You got to let me fly on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Name that movie. We're proud as peacocks to be part of American Songwriter Magazine's podcast network. This is a 30-year-old plus brand name. I think they started in 1984. Mm-hmm. One of my heroes just was on the cover this past month, John Bon Jovi. He can't go wrong with that. Nope. And we're a part of their podcast network. Pinch me. Okay. It's real. I love it. So thank you to them. Join the client community if you haven't done so already. We want to get as many people in there as we can. This is a really thriving community on Facebook. You have to ask to be let in, but we let everybody in. Just be good boys and girls and you'll thrive. There's co-writes that are happening out of there. International co-writes that are happening out of there. There's different kinds of marketing stuff and hookups that are going on and people are helping each other. People helping people are the most beautiful people. (laughs) That should be a lyric. Should I should be. Hmm. Barbara Streisand might could sing that. 
That's never mind. <laughs> anyway, subscribe to the podcast wherever you consume your podcast to make sure you get all the episodes and you don't inadvertently miss one because you're busy. You got a life mm -hmm. and tell a friend about it. That's the best thing you can do for us, man. If you're putting this kind of time into it, it's for a reason. Share the values. Let them know another artist, another songwriter, another musician. We all need some help realigning what's happening in this new music industry. And we're trying to help people get there. That's right. And then leave a rating and review. We're trying to get to 200. Please mm -hmm. leave a rating and review. We'd appreciate it. So in the climb community, the aforementioned climb community, every Wednesday we make a new post called New Heights. And so it's a chance for you to share your victories with the climb community. We want to hear them. So big or small, we love them all. And just going to share a couple from a recent New Heights segment. Let's see. Alex Rhodes show says finishing up a Christmas song and video to post next week. So that should be out by the time this airs. So go, go find Alex. He works hard. He works. Yeah. Shout out to Alex Rhodes. He works hard. Mm -hmm. And Randy England, another uh, climber we see a bunch, he said he had three great co-writes with emerging artists and songs are strong. So looking forward to more. So we got nice. people finishing up songs, doing videos, people co-writes. So everybody's kind of on their own spot in this journey. And those are all wins. And we want to celebrate and encourage each other. So if that sounds like a community you want to be part of, come on over and join the Climb community on Facebook. Love it. Mm -hmm. All right. So, man, I don't want to get my legs blown off, blowed up. Like, what? <laughs> right. My leg. All my right. leg. <laughs> so here's what's going on. So the Lyric Pitch event is something that, I, you know, I'm a lyricist myself. And so it was a new event. We're testing it out. We haven't actually hosted the event yet at the time of recording, but we have gathered songs from the Songwriting Pro and Climb communities. They send in their lyric. I review them. I curate them. I find the 10 that I think will catch our pro guest ear. In this case, Steve Dean, who wrote Watching You for Rodney Atkins, which is like most performed song of the decade. He's had wow. hits with Alabama, like Southern Star, and he's had a bunch of other cuts and stuff. So he's a pro and he's an archie like me. So we love the Razorbacks in common and suffer through. He's from the mothership. He's from the mothership. <laughs> and he's also a co-writer of mine. I know how much of a melody guy that he is and loves lyrics. I thought I hit him up about this. Like, would you be interested in reviewing some some songs from my community? We'll hop on a Zoom call like we do our play for publisher and they'll present lyrics and you can let them know what's up. And hey, if you love something, then maybe you write it with them or you can get a co-write on the books. So trying to, you know, create opportunities for the communities. Opportunities. So wait, hold on a second, because we haven't had a chance to talk about this yet. I'm just yeah. realizing this is something new. Yeah, it's new. Yeah. So I have a question. So uh -huh. Are these chosen writers that made the top 10, are uh -huh. they going to be playing song demos of that? No. Or are just, they just presenting just, the lyrics? Just presenting lyric. Even if they had it into a song, it's just lyrics, and then they're going to let... What does he think about the lyric, and would he want to put a melody to that kind of thing? That kind of... He's going to look at it going, if you brought this lyric in, like Brent does when we write, what would I think about this? What can we learn from this? Coming it's really from interesting. Guy, I mean, he writes lyrics as well, but his real strength is melody. That's his sweet spot. But he's good at lyrics, too. Sure. But he also knows how to put together a room and say, you know what? Not going to hurt us to have a lyricist in here or exactly. somebody who's yeah. I mean, we real strong on lyrics. I'm real strong on melody. So that can't hurt. Yeah. So he likes working with lyricists. I mean, he enjoys working with me and that's what I bring to the table. So because he's one of those guys that can just do melody all day long. He's like, just bring me a lyric, man. We're, and we're off to the races. So it's going to be interesting how we present it. But basically, we're just going to present these just lyrics. Like I didn't hear any of these melodies. If they have melodies, so a lot of them don't. Some of them may. But it wasn't about that. It was just looking at the lyric and going, okay, what do I think will catch Steve's eye as a, as a pro songwriter that may be something he's interested in and we can learn from? And so that's what we're putting together. So over 200 lyrics were submitted, and there were just some landmines that oftentimes got stepped on and kind of blew their lyric up. That's why they didn't make the cut. It's, it's real competitive. You got 200 songs, only 10 make the top 10. And so... You're looking for reasons to weed things out and go, right. no, not that one. Nope, not that one. And the 10 that make it through Normandy Beach. Had the least amount of reasons to be weeded out. <laughs> yeah, made it through without stepping on a landmine. I was like, boo, he blew up. Okay, how's this one? No, of course, <laughs> boom, blew up. Okay. I get it now. That's brilliant. You know, oh, yeah, like, the right. landmine on the way to the pro. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, just my opinion, but it's also, I'm a lyricist, so what I do. And so I thought, hey, it'd be helpful today if we uh, obviously not point out any specific song or songwriter, because that's not cool. But here's some things I noticed, some common mistakes, some common lyrical. Oh, and can I add something, too? I want to add a quote that I heard uh, Harry, um, oh, Chapin Carpenter, Belafonte, no. Connie no, Jr. Um, 
Harry Connick Jr. when he was a judge on American Idol. I actually got it right. <laughs> and he had some, it was like a horrific artist. Uh -huh. Just couldn't sing. Could, early like, episode, just yeah. Early, early yeah. Or maybe yeah. the first episode or something. And, you know, they deny her or him. I can't remember if it was a guy or a girl. And she's genuinely butthurt. <laughs> like, you people are idiots. Yeah. You don't see the talent. And he said one thing that resonated with me. He goes, art can be subjective, but it's also objective. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's objective up to a point where it becomes subjective. But yeah, there has to be a level of craftsmanship, of competitive craftsmanship before it becomes a taste thing. Yeah, it's kind of got to meet spec. Yeah. Yeah. Before it's a matter. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Point. You know, so keep that about. in mind when you just have to look at it like, okay, like I can do better. Like just keep growing. Up. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. All right. So if you want cuts and if your lyricist hoping to add better and better co-writers or just to find a co-writer, somebody wants to put melody to your lyrics, or if you're writing your own melodies, it sure helps to avoid the following landmines. So I picked out about five or six things and we'll just kind of go through them. Cool. First one is criticizing current hit music. If you want, in this case, is mostly Wait, what? Stuff. You saw that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's at least one song. I've seen it before on stuff that... So this isn't an anomaly. You've seen this no, before. No, I've seen it before. And I was like, well, Steve ain't going to write that because who's he going to present it to? So basically, it's a song going, this crap ain't country, but I'm country, that kind of stuff. And it's like, listen, if you want a major country artist to cut your song, that artist is probably on a major country label. And if it's a major country label, it probably has a wide swath of kinds of country music on there. That song would be bad business for the label. <laughs> they may have the more progressive, you know, your Sam Hunter, Dan and Shays, your whatever your taste is calls progressive. That ain't country music, Florida, Georgia line, or whatever your thing is. But you want somebody else on that label to, even if not by name, call them out as that ain't country, but I am. That's just kind of awkward. At the Christmas party, don't you think? Yes. And that <laughs> artist being on tour, like, I'm going to open up for this guy, or this guy's, you know, just weirdness. Yeah, that's a sure way not to get on a tour. That's just exactly. Like, dude, you just. Which guy? Oh, the guy that's got the, the hit song that's, uh, that ain't country, all other country artists suck but me. Yeah. Yeah, no. that one, yeah let's have him open for us. That'd be great. You, yeah. can, yeah. you can really nope. get him fired up, and they would love him. <laughs> Our audience would obviously love him. Yeah, of course, you're insulting all the program directors on radio yes. because you're saying their taste sucks Yeah, and everybody in the industry. Okay, go mm -hmm. on. Yes. So now that's for a major country thing. Now, if it's Texas country, red dirt, you know, you could have people that really resonate because a lot of people feel that. That's why this dude wrote this. You know, this wasn't a calculated commercial decision by this writer. This writer was feeling like this crap on the radio is crap. And right. a lot of people feel that way and take always have, by the way, about yes. what's on country radio. That ain't country. So they said Johnny Cash wasn't country when Johnny Cash came out. Exactly. Not for nothing. He wasn't country. This is crap. Yeah. That's what they said. And then he became country. So exactly. yeah, it's all yeah. relative. I mean, yeah. people's heads exploded when Marty Robbins brought, I think, a horn and drums onto the Opry stage. People were like, what? Ah! Yeah. So, <laughs> what do we do with that? Thing. At one point, you couldn't have drums on the upper stage because I ain't country. So it changes. But anyway, a lot of people feel this way. It's a legitimate feeling. And I'm not arguing with your feelings. You can feel that way all you want. But you're not going to get a major country artist to cut that kind of thing. You may get a major country artist to talk about, I am country, right? I'm so country, sure. I, I poop cow pies. But you're not going to get one to bash the other country artists, his contemporaries. You might just say, I'm real country, and that's all there is to it. Okay, that's cool. You know, you fly your flag, but you don't have to yeah. be taking shots at others. But there may be red dirt artists, independent artists who go, I want to tap into that. I want to be that guy that burns Luke Bryan and effigy during my concerts because my people will eat that mess up. Okay, cool. There is a market for that kind of stuff, but it's not a major market. No, and it's going to be a very, very, very specific small group of people who would have a brand. Mm -hmm. That would do something like that. Exactly. Yeah. That'd be so if the idea is to get a cut, then if you're not the artist that's going to sing it, good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a really small bullseye you're trying to hit. Or most pros would be like, no, I mean, I would want to write that. What am I going to do with that? Who am yeah. I going to pitch that to? Yeah. I don't want to turn a work day into a hobby day. So that's one thing. Yeah. Criticizing current hit stuff. It's that kind of negativity that we just don't need in our lives. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Show. 
So that's one. I didn't see a lot of that, but you know, there's some of that that pops up every once in a while for sure. Criticizing radio and trying to get on the radio kind of thing. The yeah. other one is, and this is a big one. We'll probably settle on this one for a while, is unfriendly phrasing. Interesting. So phrasing is the rhythm of the words in your lyric. It's how it flows when you just read it out loud. Because you may not have a melody, right? But there's a flow to it. So as a lyricist, you want to set your melody writer up for success, which means you want your lyrics to sing well, which has a lot to do with phrasing. So again, phrasing is rhythm of the words in your lyric. So good lyrical phrasing can really help your co-writer put a melody to your lyric. It has its own kind of melody in it. Here's an example of some good phrasing. This is from my last episode, so I should probably go to bed. We did a hit song breakdown, so that's episode 253. We dive into Dan and Shay's I Should Probably Go to Bed. So I'll just pull that one back up because it's a great example of good phrasing. I'm just going to read you part of the course, or maybe the whole course, and just think about how easy it is to read. I should probably go to bed. I should probably turn off my phone. I should quit while I'm ahead. I should probably leave you alone because I know in the morning I'll be calling, saying sorry for the things I said. So I, yeah, I should probably go to bed. Okay. Yeah, rolls right off the tongue. Now, they probably wrote that melody and lyric at the same time. But even if you brought that in, just as a lyric, I should probably go to bed. I should probably turn off my phone. I should quit while I'm ahead. Oh, internal rhyme. I should probably leave you alone. I should probably go to bed. I should quit while I'm ahead. They just flow. It's just easy to read. Yeah. So that's good phrasing. That's inviting a melody. Because there's kind of a potential melody already in there. As a lyricist, it always blows my mind when I can give someone four lines or eight lines or whatever, however much I got. And they just look at it and start singing it. I'm like, how'd you know that melody? I didn't. And <laughs> that I never old. gets old, right? That never gets always old. like, wow. <laughs> and then they'll, yeah. then they go, okay, no, let me see if I can beat that. And then they start tweaking and playing with the stuff. And we may move around lyric and stuff. Cause I want a great melody. Cause if it don't sing, but you're want- already like Hercules, Hercules, I'm Hercules. Like, you, do the thing you do it so special. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay, so that's good phrasing. I should probably go to bed. I should probably turn off my phone. I should quit while I'm ahead. I should probably leave you alone. It just rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? It's like, hmm, it's easy to say. Here's how it could have gone wrong. I should probably go to bed. I should probably put the phone on the nightstand on do not disturb all night. I should quit before I hurt my stupid self. Drive back home, close the door, and turn off the lights. Right. That's another way to kind of say the same stuff in the chorus. How easy right. do you think it would be to put a melody to that? I should probably go to bed. I should probably put my phone on the nightstand and do not disturb all night. I should quit before I hurt my stupid self. Drive back home, close the door, and turn off the lights. It rhymes. It's got rhymed. I make sure I rhymed on it. <laughs> but Congrats. it's the lines of different links that you don't come back to a home base. It's just the phrase. Like, I'm going to get all that phrasing, all these weird little things going on there. It's like it do- it's unfriendly. It doesn't invite you to go, oh, yeah, no, this has got a melody. I know what to do with this. It doesn't invite that. So that's something to think about. It's a big part of being a lyricist, especially if you're not doing your own melodies. Because melody will kind of make you do that if it's a decent melody. It will kind of make you stay within the structure. If mm-hmm. you don't have that melody in your head, like I don't, but I have rhythm. I have phrasing in my head. Like I will write it till it reads well and speaks well out loud. So some of the lyrics were just too hard to read. <laughs> Maybe some of the lines were too long. This is a really, really long line. This is like, is this a paragraph or a lyric? It's bordering on prose. The eye just didn't flow down the page on some of these lyrics. Couldn't read it out loud without tripping over my words a little bit. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. Yeah. And when I'm composing uh-huh. words in the form of Which emails. Which is better composing, by the way. <laughs> you know, sales copy, emails, uh-huh. different proposals, stuff like this, like mm-hmm. business stuff, right? But I will always read it out loud to uh-huh. myself and i usually end up being like oh because i trip over my damn self yeah after what i wrote down and what i thought i said in my head wasn't what was coming across but i don't find that until i go back and read it out loud because that's something that you do do you read your own lyrics back i don't usually do it out loud but sometimes i do yeah so it just depends it just depends but i've done it in my head for so many years right you know, i've been writing songs like 25 years right 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 that I wonder if that would make a difference, like if that would help somebody like, oh. And that's something I do suggest is reading them out loud and seeing it like, am I tripping over it? It might identify a a landmine or two. (laughs) How's that going to sing? Actually, while we're talking, I'm looking on my list of unwritten lyrics to see if I have one that I want to share. Oh, yeah. This is That I haven't written yet. 
Love it. Because it doesn't have melody. But just see if there's a melody in here. There's one. Just working on a little bit of a song. I may bring into a co-write, but it's called Call My Bluff. Mm-hmm. And the chorus, and there's no melody for this, but just see if this flows down. I haven't seen this lyric in a while. You call my bluff. I pick up. You say my name. And girl, I'm done. It always goes the same. We meet somewhere. You spin me around, get me high, then crash me down. And I always say this time I've had enough. And I am till the next time you reach for the phone and call my bluff. Yeah. Like, it just reads. It's, it's, it just it's reads beautifully well. simple. Boom. It's kind of simple. It flows. Like, I haven't read it in a year or whatever yeah. this lyric but you can just kind of just read it and you're like okay you call my bluff i pick up you say my name and girl i'm done it always goes the same like there's a there's a rhythm in there that's just inherent that the right melody writer is going to be able to pick up and go okay well here's some stuff you know that we can work with get us started get the ball rolling it may not be the right melody the perfect melody but it's enough to get the pick strumming a little bit or picking yeah and then you can go from there so I would recommend always reading your lyric out loud, especially until you get really good at it, really comfortable with it, and you have enough feedback going, okay, I'm good at this. And the other thing, for a while, just say for a week, every day pull up a hit lyric and read it out loud. Oh, So not just your there lyric. There you go. Well, that just happened. Hit lyric. Let the phrasing seep into your bones. Yeah. So just like the Dan and Shay thing, I should probably go to bed. I should probably turn off my phone. I should quit while I'm ahead. I should probably leave you alone. But if yours is, I should probably go to bed. I should probably, you know, and it's clunky and it's like, okay, boy, this doesn't have the flow to it. I mean, one thing that I love is we talked about, yeah, you bring it and you lay your lyric down and then they start singing it. One thing Steve Dean says, which is funny. He's like, oh man, that just sings like butter. Just sings like butter. (laughs) Put that on the, put that $20 bill on the wall for everybody going into the meeting with him. Like you want that to happen. (laughs) There we go. You want to say, oh man, that's sing like butter. Winning. Yeah. (laughs) It it just has that kind of thing. So it's a hard thing to explain because lines can be all different for different types of songs. Some have more lyrically dense, some are not, some are, but read yours, go read a pro. Go read a hit and see how it just rolls off the tongue. I'll tell you something. I did that also for all my blogs. I blogged for four years before the podcast. Mm-hmm. And then I just stopped blogging because I could cover it on the podcast and we got busy. But yeah, I did that with every blog too. And to this day, I mean, the last proposal that I put together for a potential client that we might be working with, I read it out loud again. Still, mm-hmm. guess what? Tripped over a couple of landmines. Yeah. Like it still happens. You know what I mean? Like I'm afraid yeah. not to do that, to read it out loud. Yeah. Because I know I'm going to screw it up because I'm vomiting at first. I'm just, yeah. I'm super creative. The muse is there. I'll figure out the finite construct and the craft of it a little bit later, but I have to get the ideas down while they're coming. While the muse is there, I'm going to honor the muse, but then go back and read it out loud and tweak to yeah. make it clear. The other thing is clear. When you did the different version of that, you know, you added those extra words, like what it would be like if the, I should probably go home. Um, You can't remember it that well. It's busy, right? Mm -hmm. It's too busy. And so it gets confusing. Yeah, it can be confusing. Well, and it definitely becomes harder to remember. And therefore, you're not communicating as effectively as you could Mm -hmm. with a well thought out rhythm to your lyrics. Oh, yeah. It just helps it. There's less in a way I have to pay attention to. The words flow well, so I can just focus on what you said. I mean, remember O.J. Simpson, the glove don't fit, you must have quit. That's a rhythm. Yeah. That's a rap. That's a that's <laughs> exactly. a lyric. And they use that to win. Get that in the brains of the jurors, and sure enough, they acquitted him. Yeah. and But you know what? Like, you're never going to forget that. I haven't forgotten that to this day. Everybody that just heard right. that probably hasn't forgotten that. But if they said, if the glove doesn't actually fit on his hand and it feels like it's really tight and he's struggling a little bit and he starts to sweat, then you must not, you know, <laughs> like, wait, what? Put him away for the rest of his what life. What just happened? Yeah. 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 <laughs> wait, um, you lost me already? Okay. Okay, you said the same thing, but... Yeah, economy of words. Economy of words. And, and talking about clarity, there's actually my next point, is that a lot of the lyrics were just kind of hard to follow. I'm looking down and I'm scanning them, I'm reading over every single one of them. But a lot of maybe they generalize, they have a lot of vagueness, maybe a lack of imagery to anchor me to something that I can picture. Yeah. So there's a lot of it just like, I don't really know what's going on here. 
So I'm not feeling anything because maybe you're feeling something, but I don't know why you're feeling it or I'm not feeling it. You haven't anything. communicated not, why you're feeling it. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah. It's that curse of knowledge. Maybe the writer had it in their head what was going on, what the situation was, but I'm not in your head. Your job is to put me in your head and you got to leave more breadcrumbs for me to follow. Exactly. To know what's going on. So that vagueness, but also you know, imagery is a big thing too. So the saying in Nashville, you've heard me say it a hundred times already is, Show me, don't tell me. Right. Is put some pictures in there, especially for country. But really, I think any song can benefit from a good use of some imagery. So it gives us something to hang on to. If it's just a lot of feelings, I don't know why you're feeling those feelings. It doesn't make me feel those feelings. You know? (laughs) That reminds me of the girl from Mean Girls. (laughs) What is that? The scene in Mean Girls where they got all the junior girls are in the gym. And then there's this girl, they're like, I just, I, I just want to bake a cake full of rainbows and smiles and have the world love one another. And somebody's like, she doesn't even go to the school. And then Tina Fey's <laughs> like, do you go to the school? And she's like, no, I just have a lot of feelings. She's like, get out of here. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Sorry, that just what popped into my head. No filter. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, just because you're feeling something does not obligate me to feel it too. You got to build it in both melodically, vibe-wise is definitely a big part of it, but lyrically to get me to feel those feelings. If you're just yelling, I'm sad, I'm really sad. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not RSVPing for that party. Sorry. (laughs) You know, why should I feel sad? Okay, you feel sad. I get that, but I'm not feeling sad. I'm just feeling kind of annoyed because I don't know what you're whining about. Yeah. But if you paint the picture of what makes or at least such a, a raw picture of how that sadness looks. I don't know, sitting at the piano with a glass of wine and you're plunking out, you know, one or two notes or whatever that she used to play so well, or the lights half out or whatever. And you're like, wow, oh, it's sad. You know, you draw that out of me versus forcing it on me. Or if you paint the picture of him walking away from you and just the way he does it in such a cold manner, then, I, oh, that's heartbreaking. I'm sorry. I can empathize more. Then if you just go, I'm so sad, you're gone. Well, okay, I don't really care because I've heard this song. Read the first verse, please, if you can remember it, to Let's Fight. I always go back to that. It's brilliant. Oh, uh, I know the way you breathe. So, girl, I know you're not asleep right now. There ain't no sense of this. You close your heart like a fist and shut me out. Something like that. Yeah, the first two lines. I know the way you breathe, so I know you're not asleep right now. Yeah, so I can tell you're not asleep I heard those first two lines, and I'm like, I'm right there because I've been there. <laughs> yeah, so what? I have been in that moment. And you know what I pictured? I pictured the room that we lived in. I pictured the house mm-hmm. that I was in. I don't know that I remembered the argument, but I remembered the feeling. Yeah. And you're just like, oh, and just two lines. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, you were there. <laughs> if it had just been like. Specificity, right? Specificity. I'm really angry at you and you're not looking at me and we're miles apart. Or yeah. I know the way you breathe and I can tell you're not asleep right now. <laughs> yeah. Dude, that is a vulgar display of prowess. It really is. <laughs> Thanks. But yeah, if it just been like, you know, I know you're upset. You know, we had a fight. I'm like, all right. It doesn't put me there. Yeah. I can intellectually relate to that because I've been there, but it's not pushing a button. Yeah. It's like, I understand it, but I'm not compelled by it. But yeah, you put me in that room where that happened and yeah, I'm staring at the fan looking for something to say, (laughs) you know, that kind of thing. I've written a couple of line in bed mad songs, but yeah, another one's talking about, yeah, I'm just your face to the wall and here I am staring up at the fan, just trying to think of something to say. Yeah. It's like, yeah, man, been there. It's just more real, which is another thing too, is that, oh, but for the lack of clarity, before I move on to the next point, your homework is look at some hit lyrics, print them out, and highlight the images. Ooh, Compare that to your lyric. Do the Brilliant. Same Dissect lyric. the images. Only highlight the images. Yeah. See, how much is something I can see, smell, taste, touch, or hear? Mm. How much of that is in a lyric? In your chosen genre, to get the lay of the land in, with what you do. Yeah. In country, it's going to be all over the place, and most of them. It's going to be all over the place. Some genres, it may not be as much. So you want to do what's appropriate for your genre. But I used to do that kind of stuff. I used to write out and print up song lyrics that I really admired. And, you know, when I was living by myself, when I was a bachelor and stick them inside cabinet doors and 
on the fridge and everywhere else. I mean, I was just always seeing this good lyric and so much imagery in there. So yeah, I would challenge y'all to do that. Uh, another thing. Oh, wait, what did you just say? Say that again. I would challenge you to do no, that. No, before that. Surround myself with good lyric. Okay, so I got an idea. So when mm-hmm. you print out your first song and then you highlight the imagery, mm-hmm. after you take a look at that, magnet it to the refrigerator. Yeah. So every time you go to the fridge, you think about it. And then yeah. the next time you do the next one, magnet that one to the refrigerator. Just keep swapping them out. Mm-hmm. So that every single time you have to go to the fridge, you're thinking about imagery. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, that's a good thing. Because that's basically what I used to do. I mean, just with the lyric as a whole. Yeah. Because I just wanted to see these things and absorb it and make it part of me. Osmosis. Yeah. And so, I mean, garbage in, garbage out. Keep it top of mind. Keep it top of mind. Keep it top of mind. Mm -hmm. You're never going to get distracted enough to not go to the fridge. (laughs) Right. Let's just be honest. (laughs) You only end up there eventually. That's right. So another one is too much chorus before us. All right. So some songs, you just look at them and you're like, oh my gosh, that is a massive chunk of real estate sitting there under the word chorus. Like that is like a whole song's worth of lyric right there labeled as a chorus. Oh yeah. And so man, just massive choruses that look like they'd be really boring or really hard to make into a compelling melody. Mm -hmm. You just look and go, Man, well, again, what can you do with this? Look at hit courses, write them out, compare them to yours. Not that your course not going to fit exactly right over there. It's not like you print out your lyric, you print out theirs, and you should be able to hold them up to a light and not tell the difference. No, that's not how it is because different songs are constructed differently. But you'll start seeing trends like, boy, I usually have about four more lines than they do. Okay. You know, and, yeah. and is that helping my melody writer out? Brevity is the soul of wit, right? Economy of words, that kind of stuff. It probably doesn't need to be a one-line course, but it probably doesn't need to be a 16-line course either. That's right. Save that for the guitar solo. <laughs> exactly. 16-bar guitar solo. Come on! <laughs> there you go. Yeah. It's better to leave them wanting more than leave them wanting less. You can always write up, you know, write some more in the course. And I've done that before. Like, oh, this is a little short. We need a little something else. It feels like that one, that little section in the course wants to double. Okay. Well, what else we got to say? I've done that and that's fine. But it's better that than them going, oh my gosh, this is not. And I've done that before some too, when I'm just doing some solo work. Sometimes what comes out as a course ends up really going, okay, a lot of this should be in the verse. But that's writing and rewriting. That's part of it going, oh, this is pretty long for course, kind of too much going on. Yeah, we're going to have to break down these concepts and explore them and develop them in the unpack in the verse sections and stuff like, okay, this is way too big for a course, but I bet I can really dial it down or going, you know what? This course actually would make a killer verse. Now can I make it just a really singable fun course? Yeah. It's like Lincoln Logs. What have you got to lose if it doesn't work? if you won't be night. shamed or canceled or excommunicated mm-hmm. from your family or from the planet. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, they don't care that much. So, yeah, simplify, man. You just want to simplify your lyric, that economy of words, meaning say more with less kind of thing. And, yeah, some songs like you know, like old John Michael Montgomery, I think of, hey, pretty baby, won't you give me a sign? I'll give anything to make you mine all mine. I'll do your bidding and be at your back and call. Yeah. Grundy County auction incident. Yep. I mean, that was the trick of that was the way they made all that work together and all that. It ain't going down until the the sun goes up from Garth. Yeah. From Garth. Yeah. That kind of stuff. And be my baby tonight by John Michael Montgomery. That was kind of his thing. Like he had a couple of those hits. Yeah. That song writer had that sort of stylistic rap. Yeah. That was like what he did. Yeah. And that's cool. But you're building it for that specifically. That's a different thing than just, I'm trying to write just regular I bet you he wrote a lot of songs that didn't sound like that, too. Well, yeah, those are like the two, I think. that, <laughs> And people writing from, I don't know how much he ever wrote, but the people, yeah, mostly he was doing more traditional, regular kind of st- stuff, not that rapid fire Who's stuff. the singer? Or who's the writer, I mean? I forgot. On um, the John Michael Montgomery stuff? Yeah. On oh, man, I don't remember. Co- I'm talking about the writer. Yeah, I don't remember. Saying, I bet you that writer, whether he got him cut or not, has way more songs that aren't like that. That's a very sort of special thing that just worked. It worked. The design was good. 
Yeah, it gave us something different to stand out from all the others. It was fun. It was a challenge. That was the fun of that one to go, can I sing along with this and not <laughs> get the words right? It was a play along at home song for sure. And that was the fun of that. Some are just so easy to sing along to that you just can't help but do it. Others are like, oh, this is fun. This is a challenge. Yeah. See if I can do it. And that was part of the fun of that song. I remember when those songs came out, like, okay, let's see what we can do. See if I can get it. Oh, almost got it. Next time it comes on the radio, I'll, I'll do better. Yeah, flex but that muscle. Of, exactly. It is. It's play along at home. And that was the fun of it. But most lyrics aren't like that. Most songs aren't like that. And you want to simplify and make sure you're not having too much course that's just going to be intimidating or it's going to be so long that like, because I've written those that like, wow, well, that course really didn't wrap up in a timely manner. Right. It went a couple lines too long and just kind of petered out at the end. <laughs> or like, this is looking great like, up until 10 minutes ago. <laughs> it's like, you can't quite land the plane. Oh, it's like, oh, this is good. This is good. And like, we couldn't either lyrically or melodically like land that plane in a good, timely manner and just uh, kind of ran out of gas. Still about 15 feet up in the air. <laughs> no. <And> a crash. <laughs> oh, that was a rough landing. That's how, rough Leonard, landing. That's how we lost Leonard Skinner, people. Like, <laughs> uh, so. Not not a thing we want to continue. So, so that's another one. Uh, last one here is, I don't believe you. So uh, this is Ooh. this is hard to define. Wow. But sometimes it just comes down to, uh, this feels made up. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's your song you wrote, but it shouldn't feel written. It shouldn't feel made up, even if you made it up. So there are a couple ways you can get to that. Sometimes it's because it's clever. But it doesn't feel true. It doesn't have heart. It may have cleverness and wordplay, but it doesn't have heart and emotion to it. So it's like, okay, this is clever. He's playing off this and that and the whatever thing. But it just kind of feels like you just made up a little song. It doesn't feel real. And sometimes songs can be that if they have a great melody and they feel so good, I don't really care. But at this point, we're bringing in a lyric. Like, why is someone going to be drawn to this? I just don't, I just don't care. You know, I just don't believe you. It's just wordplay. It's clever, but it's not pushing any of the emotional buttons. And the difference is objective. And yeah. if you don't know the difference yet, you will. But mm -hmm. you have to do more work. You have to write more songs. Then it will become clear to you like, oh, you're right. A year later, you'll look back. Now I know what having more heart to clever lyrics means. Yeah. I heard one of the writers of uh, Drive Your Truck talk about this and NSAI. I don't know, camp that I was also teaching at. And she said, yeah, wordplay still has to be true. Like you can't just say, oh, this is so clever. I'm going to yeah, say because it. Because it works. Yeah, because the words work it's to, if it's not the message, if it's not true. If it's not the message, if it's not the truth, if it's not the emotion, it then it's just. And clever is a it. crutch, isn't it? It can be a great tool. Like if you can say the truth in a clever way. But there's a difference between a tool and a crutch. If there's no substance, yeah. it's a crutch, right? And you think yeah, you've just, completed your job because you have a clever lyric, but if there's no truth to it, then you haven't done your job. You really haven't completed the job. Yeah. It, it appears finished, but it is not. Right. And so therefore, like it may look good and it may feel good, but the design doesn't work. Like from the uh, a Dirty Dozen. Well, they look they look pretty, but can they fight? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Are they worth well, the damn? Well, may kind of gussy up your, your lyric a little bit, but it ain't going to fight. But Just is it worth the damn? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and sometimes maybe it's because I don't believe you because it was too cliche and it felt like you just wrote down like all the stuff you've heard in other songs. Yeah. Like, oh, this is kind of one cliche after another. I don't. And my, hey, I've been guilty of like all these, okay? Every, so every not, artist I and every songwriter is. Myself, okay, so I'm not holding myself of anything. I've just been at it a long time and worked my butt off. And I still will make some mistakes and still dialing it in. It's always a process because every song is new. But, you know, I've made all these mistakes. I've had, yeah, I'm writing this song about the girl that left the guy and I've never had a girlfriend up to this point or whatever. And I'm just writing down what I hear in songs and what it sounds like they say in songs. And, and it's, so it sounds that way. And you're like, yeah, it just looks like you made up a song. It doesn't look like I believe you. So a good example of I believe you to me, anyway, one I thought of when I was working on this was Talladega by Eric Church. Yeah, He wrote with Luke Laird and it's talking about with some of his boys going to Talladega when they're like maybe in high school or whatever. Uh, Five best what, friends on four ball times. Deal was, you know, if we could get a run, we'd go. 
400 miles and four ball tires or whatever. We made it to Talladega. Boys, raise up the whiskey in your glass. Here's to turn it up and whatever. You know, it's like all this stuff, you know, shooting Roman candles up in the sky kind of thing. Man, it sure would be nice to stay in Talladega. It was that checkered flag wave and sure would like to stay in Talladega. It's like, I believe it. I don't know if they've ever been to Talladega. I've never been to Talladega. Yeah. But I feel like I have a little bit now. I get a sense of the vibe of it. There's a romanticism that they wrote into it. It feels. For sure. Looking back, nostalgia, this great weekend. Yeah. Yeah. And I believe it. I don't know if it's true, but I believe it. Yeah. Because of the details. It's not like, you know, it's the little details of just about you know, raising up the whiskey in your glass. Yeah. That's nothing like unbelievable. Like, yeah, man, the cars go by. You're like, woo. You know, you got your hands up. You got your drink in your hand or shooting Roman candles. Like that's not anything I would have ever thought of as going on in Talladega. But it's one of those little details you're going, I bet they've been there. Yeah. Yeah. Because you see people shooting fireworks off the top of the Winnebago's, I guess. And even I believe if, it. Even if you haven't. It doesn't sound like something you'd make up. doesn't sound like something you'd make up. And that's the details we want is it doesn't sound like something you'd just make up. Yeah. And, and even if you haven't been there, right, there's hooks in there that – Raise your hand right now if you had a point in your life from the time you were able to start driving until whenever where you were driving like a total S box, you know, with bald <laughs> tires, just a piece of crap because that's all you could yeah. afford. And so all of a sudden, like that, I can relate to that. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. oh I've been there. Okay. Now I'm in. I'm in. Now yeah. that's a Trojan horse right into that romantic and that nostalgic feeling, isn't it? Because that was a while yeah, ago. Going on a- and going on a road trip with your boys, you know, with your buddies. Yeah. There's that in there. So maybe one Talladega, maybe it was something else. Yeah. But there's still enough of that, like, that camaraderie with your friends that you, there's a lot of places you can kind of emotionally hang on to. But even if you hadn't been there, like, to me, it's interesting because it feels like Talladega in my mind, even though I haven't been there and I've seen some on TV, but it's like, oh, that's cool. Like, that, what an interesting place to spend three and a half minutes. In my mind, hanging out with these guys. It just feels believable, even if they made it up. I mean, I remember when Monday Morning Church was out, somebody came up to me and they're like, oh, man, I'm sorry. Did you lose somebody? I'm like, <laughs> well, I made it up. Um, but that's our job is the details and stuff. That's to winning, make it believable. winning, winning. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the gig <laughs> is to I love find that. those details and the emotional truth. I can love that story. That even if you haven't quite lived it, you find those details that are not, that doesn't sound like something somebody would have just made up or they pulled it out of another song. And that's the believability. And that's just so huge. It's so huge. Just, and it's, again, it's hard to put your finger on. Well, it kind of looks like a duck, kind of walks like a duck, but it smells like a skunk. Yeah, It's just something that ain't quite a duck. I don't know what that is, but it's, mm, yeah, it's something wrong. Something's off. Yeah. Sometimes you feel that way about songs. And that takes a lot of practice to get there. I mean, sometimes people are writing songs about stuff that really happened to them, and I don't believe them. Yeah. (laughs) Because the the chops just aren't there yet. Yeah. That's a good point. And But that takes reps. It takes studying what works. It takes building that imagery muscle, all that stuff. So, yeah, it's got whatever it is, whatever kind of song, funny song, a heartbreak song, a love song, a sexy song, whatever, a party song. It's got to feel real. It's got to feel real at the end of the day. And that's a big question to ask yourself. Does this feel real? Like, would somebody believe they just stumbled across a page of my diary Yeah. if they ran across this? Yeah. Do you think there's a vulnerability factor in there, too? There is, isn't there? Like, it sure helps. They're just afraid to be that open? It might be. They're not willing to do the the, kind of the deep work of diving in and saying a line that feels a little too close to home. I heard writers talking about one time, like, you should write about... Uh, what you know. Someone else like, oh, you should write about what you're afraid to know. <laughs> or, you know, like keep digging deeper and deeper, like what you're, uh, you know, afraid to say about yourself. Yeah. That kind of, that's the kind of stuff you need to put in there. Like, that's the stuff that people are going to relate to uh, because we're all so similar. Yeah. I heard somebody say one time, like, I went into my 20s, I think it was maybe Craig Wiseman. I went into my 20s thinking how different I was from everybody else, how unique I was as an artist and all this stuff. He goes, I came out of my twenties, realized we're all the same. (laughs) That guy's just as full of crap as me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. 
And realizing, like, I can put myself into these songs. And if I can relate to it, if I can feel it, a lot of people are going to be able to relate to it and feel it because I'm not that different. Yes. So if you feel it, instead of worrying about, well, what do people want to hear? Like, what's, what are you feeling? What's, like, true for you? Yeah, you know, some things will be mass market material. Some things won't be. But the more you can kind of dive in and get used to going there and spilling it, then when you come across that thing that does work for mass market, it's going to be more believable. And you're going to be used to doing that work. That's the thing. That's why you got to catch a whole lot of balls in practice before they throw it in the game. Right. Because you've done it and you've done it and you've done it. Now, when the lights come on, it's muscle memory. It's like, all right. And that's what a lot of writing is, is building that muscle and that craft. So when that, that idea, the one you've been waiting on, the one we're all waiting on, shows up, you don't have to build the machine. You already know what to do. You have the tools in the toolbox. Because the, the method, the craft may be the same as on those, the previous 200 songs. But now, you know, that idea, that little bit of pixie dust or whatever it is that comes with that idea you're doing the same thing you did with all those others. I mean, the process of me writing songs that have been number one or hits or gotten cut, really not different from the songs that the process I used to write songs that didn't like, I can't go, that was different. We did this other thing. No, but just the idea or it's just you know, the numbers thing that one made it through. That one didn't step on a relationship landmine or something else, you know? Yeah. But you, you work on that craft, so when those special ideas show up, you know what to do with it. And you can write it believably. Awesome. So, listen, I'm not saying that all the lyrics that made it into the top 10 for the lyric pitch event are, like, perfect in all these regards. And you can see the list on my blog, so songwritingpro.com. Just go to the blog. It's going to be several down at this point, but you can see and view the list of the top 10 and the on hold, which is, like, the next 10 out. But the songs on country radio, they, yeah, they pretty much avoid all these lyrical landmines. All of them. And so you want to avoid them in your songwriting, too. If you want to get on the radio, whatever your radio of choice is, man, study that stuff and compare it on phrasing, on how long that chorus is, use of the imagery, believability, all that stuff. It's huge. So I just encourage you all to look that up and do some study. Love it. That's what I got. I love it. I love it. I love it. All right, so that brings us to the end of another Killer Climb episode. Oh, real quick. Actually, I have a gift for you for hanging out with us for an hour almost. Is I have a free ebook. It's called Think Like a Pro Songwriter. You can find it at songwritingpro.com slash gift, or just go to songwritingpro.com. You'll see it up at the top. But songwritingpro.com slash gift. It just outlines some of the lessons I've learned over my years in the music business, and it will just kind of help you get going on a good path. So anyway, that's it. Songwritingpro.com slash gift. There you go. All right, guys. Well, hey, um, I hope you had a great Christmas. And this will be right before New Year's, I I believe. So So, hope you have a good New Year's Eve. And this podcast exists because we want you to win. Let's hope that 2021 is better for the love of all that is holy. (laughs) This podcast exists because we want you to win. So keep on climbing. And we'll see you at the top.